On behalf of the American Academy of Neurology and in collaboration with Neurology Today, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Neil Busis. Dr. Busis is a clinical professor in the Department of Neurology at NYU Langone School of Medicine. Uh, he arrived actually on March 1st. 2020. Wow, what a time to arrive in New York City, uh, especially being one of your responsibilities was to focus on telemedicine. I mean, oh boy, uh, boy, oh boy, oh boy, that's all I can say. Um, he's also an Associate Chair of Neurology at NYU, uh, Vice Chair of the American Academy of Neurology Health Policy Subcommittee, uh, and a member of the AAN's Joint Coordinating Council on Wellness. And formerly, you were on uh, the AAN's Board of Directors, so you've worn many hats across a variety of, a variety of roles. Um, he's also worked on the National Academies of Medicine consensus study called Systems Approaches to Improve Patient Care by Supporting Clinician Wellbeing, and that's really going to be the focus of our discussion today. Um, you know, we're, we're in a new world. We're in, um, you know, COVID-19 world. Um, we've talked about burnout, and we've had burnout problems across neurology and medicine for, you know, years and years now. Uh, but I want to talk to you about, is this a different kind of burnout that we may be experiencing? Um, you know, our day-to-day -day has changed, uh, financial pressures, issues with telemedicine, which could be good, could be bad. Um, I'd love to just get your opinion about, you know, what, what burnout is. Maybe you can just define it. Um, and maybe what the new burnout may turn out to be. Well, those are great questions. And thank you for inviting me to this uh, interview. The official definition of burnout is a combination of depersonalization, emotional exhaustion, and a feeling that you're not accomplishing anything in you personally. For healthcare professionals, the first two, the emotional exhaustion, the depersonalization, rank way above the lack of personal accomplishment. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that there's a lot of debate now about how we define burnout, and those may actually not be the best terms to use as we're going forward. There are other things coming to the fore, such as moral distress, moral injury. Right. Um, and uh, so this is an active area of research. When we wrote our consensus study, of course, we didn't conceive that there would be a global pandemic with lots of societal stressors, government stressors, et cetera. But we designed a systems approach, which we think still holds up, although the emphasis may be different. What we were saying back uh, in the fall of last year when we finalized this study and presented it, was that we conceived of physician burnout and all clinician burnout actually in the healthcare professions as an imbalance between job resources and job demands. And that most of the issues were at the systems level, maybe 80% was at the systems level, and the 20% was the individual's resilience and background and personality and things like that. I think that things have switched with COVID mm -hmm. because although we said all burnout is local, in other words, your organization is different than mine, et cetera, at this point, I think with COVID, the burnout is hyperlocal. It's you, your family, your loved ones, your, your unit, your office, you're part of the organization. And there are new uh, concerns, literally your physical health, which weren't so important before. They were always important, but they're much more important now. So uh, uh, things have changed a lot. It's the same theme, but the emphasis has now changed more towards individual issues, although the systemic ones are still uh, very important. For example, a systemic issue is... Um, the government response, for example, to COVID. That's a systemic issue. So they're all related, but uh, more and more individual uh, uh, concerns are coming to the fore. Gotcha. Um, one of the, you know, conf you know when, when, when we've been up against this and in different parts of the country, there's, you know, little, it's like New York City all over again when I turn on the news now. And it's like, I get like physically like ill. I don't know if it's like, um, I don't know, I just get like sick to my stomach a little bit seeing it and like, it's just emotionally distressing seeing what's going on now in different parts of the country compared to, you know, what you, you and I lived through literally um, like just, just the explosion in, in March and April. Um, the other added aspect that I've really um, kind of seen in my colleagues and, and friends is the financial aspect. And, um, you know, we like our jobs or love our jobs. I think most, most, most physicians, when you're 
media, even mediumly burned out, still really love hurt, love helping patients and, and giving back to the world. And this is why we did it. We didn't go into medicine to, you know, to, to, to be rich and famous. We, we did it to help patients. And I think that's the case in the vast, vast, vast majority of people. Um, but when it comes to especially younger doctors and, and you know, even mid, mid-stage and, and even across all areas of, of, of you know, mid-career senior, senior physicians also, the financial aspects, um, I think, has been really striking for some people. Um, you know, I, I know um, I was a residency program director for 12 years. Um, the, the jobs that people are taking now are totally different. The incentives are different. The promises are gone. Um, you know, some people um, actually now don't have the job that they were negotiating in February, and now they're going to be unemployed for a few months. Um, how do you um, kind of parse out the impact of the financial implications of what's happening with COVID-19 uh, with the with with its effect on burnout, uh, job dissatisfaction, happiness, moral injury, is it is it a how, how do you parse those things out? That's also a great question. The studies that have been done in physicians show that monetary reward is not a big part of burnout. Mm-hmm. When we looked at lots and lots of factors. It was workload, it was meaningful work, it was administrative support, autonomy, things like that. That being said, you have expenses, you have your rent or your mortgage, you have student loans, uh, you have your practice. When I was in private practice, I was the last one paid, right? I had to pay the heat, the light, the rent on the building, the office staff before I took a penny home. So clearly, no money, no mission. And people are having to um, realign uh, some of their career plans because of this. It's very fortunate that CMS and HHS, Health and Human Services, have recognized this. And I think that that's the impetus behind their opening up telehealth uh, and other um, uh, avenues for reimbursement to make it easier to get decent reimbursement during this era where a lot of people um, either wouldn't be reimbursed for the care they would have gotten, in other words, when telehealth wasn't reimbursed, or uh, as I'm sure you know and may have talked about in one of your uh, broadcasts, some people are literally not going to the doctor because they're too scared. There are papers like, where have the strokes gone? And things like that. So uh, government and payers... uh, other than the government, are trying to to make us whole. It's in their interest to do so because I I truly believe that if there are no doctors left, patients won't get any care. So I think it's in everybody's interest, society's interest, the payer's interest, everybody's interest to to try to make us whole. And and so not only have they started to reimburse for telehealth, they're changing rules on co-pays, they're changing some of the onerous quality reporting requirements, putting a lot of these things on pause so that it's easier to see patients uh, and um, get a fair reimbursement for it. When it comes to telemedicine, we have these, um, uh, I guess, temporary-ish rules, right? And, you know, we talked a little earlier about how the insurance companies will say one date they'll, they'll reimburse full to, and then they'll have to extend it because the pandemic keeps going. And, you know, when, when is Medicare going to keep doing it through? When, when are we still going get, to keep getting paid for, for the telephone visits? Let's just say, um, I don't know, six months or a year from now, things are doing better. I, it, unfortunately, it's probably going to be more like a year or more from now. Um, I hate to say that, but hopefully things start getting somewhat a little bit better in a year. Who knows when things are at our new normal. Uh, maybe we're at 60% in infected rates. So maybe we almost have herd immunity. Who knows when we're going to get there. But do you think the persistence of telemedicine past COVID-19 pandemic years, will that have a tangible impact on burnout, do you think it will lead to actually a silver lining of better quality of life because physicians can have more flexibility, stay at home more, still get paid? Or are you worried that the regulations will roll back, that telehealth is going to uh, maybe not disappear, but just become less worthwhile? People have been advocating telehealth yeah. for years and years and years. Um, And I think that with this COVID crisis, 
the genie's out of the bottle. And I think there's no going back. I think the question is not if there will be any telehealth, but basically what percentage of our practices will be. And our best guesstimate is maybe 20, 25%. It's going to be driven by four R's, reimbursement, RVUs, return on investment and risk. But Seema Verma, who's head of CMS and others, have said they can't see rolling this back because I think that they want the best care for their beneficiaries. The exact details are uncertain. Uh, The exact um, mix in your practice versus mine and others is different. For example, if you are a proceduralist, until computers have robot arms, there's no way to do procedures other than in person. But if you're primarily a cognitive specialty, and lots of your work involves speaking or testing or verbal or visual things that travels very well over telehealth, I think that you will have a, a pretty big proportion of people uh, in it as long as it reimburses and as long as your organization basically buys in. If they cut the legs from out from under the reimbursement, then I think that um, especially since the organization now have financial pressure to make up for the last several months, it's not going to be a big part. Yeah. I want to get back to something you said before about some of the differences and how the COVID-19 pandemic, the, the specific differences can impact burnout in a different way. And maybe that was different from the National Academies of Medicine report that, you know, you weren't thinking about. And one of those things you mentioned that resonated with me uh, was about, you know, uh, the person's, the, the physician's own health and safety and the health and safety of their family members. Um, you know, I, uh, March 6th is when my wife was exposed. She remembers it vividly. I said, ah, oh, you're fine. It's, you, know, you weren't exposed. It's okay. He was just coughing. It's fine. Nothing happened. Five days later, her temperature goes up. She's a surgeon. Uh, and then next thing I know, I start coughing. Then of course we're like, well, we knew this could happen, but we decided to do it. And we have a four month old baby. So there's, there's, you know, every family is going to have their thing whether it's an elder grandparent that they see or a parent that's living with them or a child in the home, uh, physicians, um, you know, signed up to help patients, but, um, did they exactly sign up to sacrifice one's health or or their life or the life of their family? Maybe not so much. Um, do you think, but that being said, uh, every single physician, every neurologist in, in my department that I spoke to, 100%, which is a, a big number, decided to volunteer, decided to help, wanted to help in any way they could, whether it's manning the phones or it's jumping to the ER or doing whatever it could, whatever, a fever clinic. You know, some of us jumped to start you know, doing a fever clinics, which has nothing to do with neurology. Do you think... Um, when physicians who jumped right in and who may have gotten sick or may have infected someone, how do you think that could affect burnout? Will it lead to retirements? Will it lead to career changes? Will it lead to something else? Is that more of a burnout issue, more of a moral injury issue? Is that just a matter of semantics or how do you think that's going to play a role? I think that there is a lot of concern that could that plays into this. Uh, there was a wonderful paper from Tate Shanafel and Jonathan Ripp, who's up the street at Mount Sinai and Mickey Trockel, that looked at sources of anxiety in physicians during COVID-19. Mm. And that, you mentioned, is one of the big ones. They talked about access to personal protective equipment, getting infected, bringing infection home, infecting their coworkers. Um, and, and so... Um, I think that that will affect people's behavior. On the other hand, we all signed up to take care of patients. We feel survivor's guilt if we're not helping. And so there is, a, there is moral distress. And I think that unfortunately, everyone has to make their own decisions. And, and, and I think that because of this, Many, many wellness programs are rolling out much more robust individual interventions than they did before to deal with this. There is no one size fits all. Um, My age is different than your age. My medical history is different than your history. The risks are different. Family life's different, et cetera, et cetera. And so you have to try to navigate that with the most expert help you can. 
and and uh, there is a, a rich literature on disaster psychology, actually on how to help this, and um, uh, those are promoting a sense of safety, promote calming, promoting a sense of empowerment, promote connectedness, and promote hope. But how that's applied to the individual is different. So I think it's going to have profound effects on the practice mix of people going forward and even, even during the, the pandemic. And, and I would hope that individual institutions would be cognizant of that. So that if someone has a, is in a high risk group, pregnant, immunosuppressed, older, et cetera, that the organization will say, you can help, but you don't have to be on the front line in the emergency room with layers and layers of PPE. And that's, of course, another way that, that, that telehealth comes in because Telehealth was originally conceived as a way to break down barriers to access to care. Who would have thought that it's all flipped on its head? It is the most potent form of PPE there is. Yeah. Yep. Couldn't, couldn't agree with you more. Um, yeah, I think, I think telehealth, um, you know, there, there's, there's reluctancy, I think, from department administrators to get to um, – I don't know, dependent or in the, in the zone of telehealth, I think that's, that's my, my, my observation because, you know, then doctors, when are they going to, then they're going to be very complacent and just going to be happier and prefer to stay out when coming in, you're going to miss out on, you know, whatever it is from procedures to whatever else. But I think, you know, it, over the long haul, there's got to be a, a blended, blended approach. You said earlier that you, you would anticipate or you would predict that 25% of, of care may be, um, telemedicine, you know, I guess it's, you know, summarized all throughout neurology. Um, I mean, wow. In some ways that's a, t that's a huge amount. In some ways it's a smaller amount, but, but I think, I think, you know, incrementally speaking, um, I think it could add tremendous value and especially for the next year or whatever it is, um, it, it's the ultimate PPE, <laughs> PPE. You know, we're today, uh, I just got an email saying, aside from masks, aside from, you know, one person in the waiting room per hour, aside from full cleansing, aside from like all these regulations, now all healthcare providers have to also be wearing face shields. Okay, good idea. But, you know, I mean, it's just the, um, the it's going to be a continual battle to protect ourselves and our staff um, from, you know, getting this if, if they haven't had it already um, and telehealth, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, do you, do you think quality of care is going to, so, you, you know, at some point someone will do a study about the um, you know, quality of care outcomes from telehealth versus in, I'm sure it's already been done in, across a variety of, of other subtopics, but I feel like at some point across medicine after COVID, they'll do the studies and we'll, they'll actually evaluate whether telemedicine can provide as good, if not, you know, better or worse care, whatever it is. Um, do you think some people are, some practitioners are more well suited for telehealth and others would just just aren't well suited and that will contribute to burnout. Do you, do you think it just takes time for, you know, you, you've had a, a ton of experience now with telemedicine, especially again, being charged with overseeing telemedicine pursuits and, and I'm paraphrasing, but in the department of neurology at NYU and then bam, March 1st, 2020 hits and you're here and your job started immediately. Do you think some physicians are just more cut out for telemedicine and, and like it better? Do you think administrators should force the issue or how do you see people's adaptation abilities to telemedicine and telehealth practices and its contributions on, on wellness and burnout? There is tremendous individual variation. Some of it has to do with your subspecialty. So if you are a neuromuscular specialist yeah. and you really have to do very detailed neuromuscular exams for peripheral neuropathies and this pattern and that pattern, that's kind of hard to do on a direct to consumer direct to patient model of telehealth without an assistant. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you're doing mainly cognitive things and there's um, an assistant at the other end, it's fairly easy. Mm -hmm. That being said, even within those specialties, there are different people who react differently um, to um, the different type of connectedness. It's not lack of connectedness, it's just a different type of connectedness. I personally think it's more intimate Mm -hmm. I can see the patient in their home. Yeah. I can see them in their kitchen. I can see them on their steps. I can assess how they're doing, yeah. uh, understand family stress. Others don't like it. And I have heard anecdotally that some people find that they are much more tired 
after doing a day of telehealth than, than uh, in the office. I guess they get it in between the patients, get up and move around and interact with the staff, et cetera. Um, that's a, a cross between data and anecdotes, which is anecdata, as I'm sure you've heard that word. <laughs> I, I get invigorated by it. So yes, there are, there are different, uh, um, there are differences. Uh, and and um, when it's mandatory, it's easy. Everybody does it. That's the only way you see patients. But when things settle out, yes, I would imagine just like people choose different specialties, mm -hmm. different people feel more comfortable with it or more connected with patients in one setting versus the other. And, and hopefully the organization will let them choose that. Great. So to conclude, um, you know, we've talked about more about, you know, COVID's effect on, on burnout, the differentiating factors, semantics, different contributors. But when it comes to, um, you know, addressing wellness, prioritizing wellness and addressing burnout, um, you know, for, for, for practitioners like us who are going through more, much more difficult times than, than our norms. Um, we've had a, we had a great discussion of, uh, right you know, probably in March or April, a while back now with Jennifer Bickle uh, on, on wellness. Um, had a conversation with Bob Roth uh, recently about um, a meditation, transcendental meditation, other strategies. Um, to summarize, are there any specific uh, approaches or recommendations you have if there's, an, if there's a member, neurologist, anyone, practitioner out there, uh, APP, whoever, that's, that's been, been working on this and, and, and having a tougher time? Um, what strategies do you suggest? What resources? Um, what gestalt advice do you have for someone that is experiencing some, any degree of, of anywhere from burnout to, uh, to moral injury? It, there's both a top-down and a bottom-up approach, and both are necessary. One of my favorite quotes about burnout is that you um, don't drown by falling into the river. You drown by staying submerged. Everyone is going to have bad days. Everyone's going to have bad outcomes. But um, you need to learn how to deal with that. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is that, and you may have heard this from one of your other interviewers, we really need to rethink the triple aim and make it the quadruple aim. The, the triple aim, which is population health, patient care, low cost, should be physician and clinician wellness has to be added to it because it's good for everybody. It's, it's a quality and safety issue. It's a public health issue. It's a workforce issue. It's a cost issue. Burned out physicians make more mistakes, higher turnover, et cetera. So you can't afford to, to ignore it. And so I would say to the leaders out there, you have to pay attention to this. That's really what the action collaborative for the NAM is doing, is le reaching out to leaders at every level to, to let them know how important this is and to give them tools for the top-down approach. Uh, right now, uh, in the middle of this pandemic, I have uh, uh, stated that I think we need more individual interventions. Uh, the systems approach is great, but when you think about it, individual innovation interventions are a systems approach. If, you're, if your um, uh, organization has counseling, has uh, flexibility with scheduling, uh, has some autonomy, that is an institutional approach at the individual level. That's great. Neil, thank you so much. Uh, we hit uh, every possible topic. Um, well, and, and again, welcome to New York. Um, I'm not sure which side of the aisle you're on, if you're a Mets fan, a Yankees fan, or you're from Pittsburgh, so you're probably a – are you a Pirates? I don't know what, what – what, uh, their baseball's been a little – Steelers and, uh, and Penguins, so that's gotcha. going to pay. Well, reg regardless, I don't know if we're going to be having live sporting events anytime soon, but um, hopefully you'll get to enjoy no, – no Broadway shows for the rest of the year, but hopefully you get to Central Park and get to enjoy uh, the, the – some other – uh, stuff in New York uh, until uh, it's going to be a, a little while to we open again, unfortunately. So, uh, Neil, thanks again so much. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks very much. Cool. Thanks.